The root problem with conventional currency is all that all the trust that that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency. But the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. Cake Wallet is trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tooman interviews Brian B. Salston, who recently declared his candidacy for U.S. Senate in a tweet where he announced his primary objective for running is to make Bitcoin legal tender. Solston is running as a Democrat in the state of Washington. Doug and Solston discuss why he is so focused on Bitcoin and whether he would advocate on behalf of Monero too. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Brian, how's it going, man? It's going good, Douglas. Thank you for having, having so, me. Of course, of course. Uh, eager, eager to talk to you. I came across your tweet, I think it was a day or two ago, where you had announced that you're running for Senate. And yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's, I'm running on Bitcoin and it, on Bitcoin. it went to 2 million impressions on, on Twitter. That's, that's what you call viral. It went viral. I got to say, I'm jealous. I got to say, I ran, I, I announced, I ran for Congress in 2020 in New York. Mm -hmm. um in the fourth congressional district and i ran as a pro monero candidate so i'm sure we'll, we'll get into that more but yeah there wasn't uh an overwhelming amount of support from the crypto community itself obviously people in monero people that you know there was support but there wasn't like this uh you know viral moment um so kudos to you man uh, yeah, riding that Thank wave, you. and uh, I see there's a lot of other people that are, are that are riding that wave. Uh, maybe I was a little a little too much too soon, or you know, maybe maybe the Monero angle is a little more niche, and we'll we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Kudos to you, and I love that you just put it out there up front as part of your announcement tweet uh, when you said you're running. I believe you said uh, you want to make Bitcoin legal tender. Uh, oh, yeah. I think you also made a, a reference to the Great Reset, saying Bitcoin is the Great Reset. So, oh, yeah. why, don't we, why don't we start on that? I guess number one, why are you running? Is it is it purely f out of the uh, the what you see as the need to 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 support uh, Bitcoin, or are there other reasons? And um, two, what what did you mean by that tweet exactly? Well, um, why I'm running, uh, it, it's really about you know, when you get into Bitcoin, you really start studying it. Uh, you realize that what, like, like if we talk about what Satoshi Nakamoto wrote in 2009, um, it's really about a broken monetary system. And when you see that broken monetary system and seeing how about every 10 years, it's, it is becoming more broken, almost by an order of magnitude. Um, Everything else that sits on top of our monetary system. Yeah, you see cracks and breaks, but it's all related back to this broken monetary system. So it's clearly become a very big issue in my mind. It's bigger than homelessness. Homelessness is a huge issue, but it direct, it's directly related to our broken monetary system. And so everything else just seems to be going out of focus and Bitcoin is becoming more in focus for me it's 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 becoming an increasingly interesting topic i i really enjoy hanging out with other bitcoiners and and doing a deep dive on this stuff because it's uh it's so interrelated with so many topics now 
so were there were there other reasons as well why you're running or you're really focused on on the bitcoin let's let's you know let's focus on that and there's so much other other good that's gonna go along with it is that kind of your uh, it, yeah it's really I, I i i really started off as a single issue voter i wrote my senator i wrote the house of representatives she was you know susan susan susan, susan delpaney very responsive um took a number of actions helped out um, my, my Senator, however, just went right over her head in no response. You know, will, will you sign up for my newsletter? I, I offered my time to help with her staff, you know, no response. Um, this is an important topic and if politicians are, you know, I, I think it's a generation issue issue. It, 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 a lot of boomers just are not interested in monetary policy. They're not interested in Bitcoin. You know, they're, they're benefiting from this money printing, but, you know, their, their homes are going up, stocks are going up nominally, not in real numbers, but in nominally they're going up. So, they, hey, they're, they're doing good. And the millennials, they're, they're part of a rig system. They're, they're in trouble. So I think the millennials are very responsive to my tweets and, and uh, they understand what the Great Reset is all about. Uh, the, the millennials cannot pay a debt of $30 trillion, which, by the way, is compounding now. And, you know, like Jeff Booth says, are you a Jeff Booth fan? I'm a big Jeff Booth fan, uh, the guy who wrote uh, the, the Price of Tomorrow. No, I don't really follow him much. Yeah, he, he I, I really synced up with, with his book. And uh, one thing that he likes to talk about is if you fold a paper over in half and you fold it again um, and you do that um, 50 times, the question is, how high will that that stack of papers be after you fold it over. You can only fold it seven times, but theoretically speaking, if you could fold it 50 times, how high will it be? And nobody gets this right because they don't understand the power of the exponent, the power of compounding. And it goes from here to the sun. That's how tall the stack of papers becomes. So we're in a situation where our debt is compounding now. And it has been, but it's compounding at an accelerated rate. We're $30 trillion in debt. Can the millennials pay that off? You know, did the millennials, um, did they really sign up to pay for all these boomer entitlements too? And so, yeah, Bitcoin, is it the great reset? Because if it's a choice, if it's an exit, it is a great, it is the great reset. And one of the big things that's pressing right now is sovereign debt or uh, sovereign um, default. Uh, it's um, you look at Russia, you look at the situation over there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they default within 60 days. It's possible. Maybe it'll take six months. Regardless, there's a lot of people that have exposure to, to Russia right now. Turkey has a lot of exposure. A lot of uh, European banks have a lot of exposure. So these Western banks that, you, you know, have already the world has a huge amount of debt right now. Uh, we're stretched very thin. Commodity prices are going up. Margins are falling. Um, people are not making money, and so there's 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 really unprecedented uh, there's there's really unprecedented pressure on these Western countries and the sovereign debt that they have built up. You know, thanks to let's call it Keynesian economics, a lot of stimulus. Ever since we went off of the gold standard in 1971, it's been building for the past. 50 years now. And, uh, and so if, if, if sovereign debt, if there's a default in Russia, it's going to impact other banks that have exposure. And you could see a cascading impact. You could see a, a Eurasian contagion happen. And if that happens, um, you know, who, who needs to uh, pay the price for that, right? If the bonds, you know, we have $400 trillion worth of bonds out there roughly. Uh, and if they start to sink, you know, the survivors are going to go to the, the next boat. You know, think of 400 Titanic ships slowly sinking at different rates and the survivors going to the next boat and the next boat. And then, you know, if that cascades, where are they going to go? Mm -hmm. And I think I think uh, the assets aren't going to disappear or or you're not going to be creating more assets. It's just it's just bookkeeping. It's just the ledger system. Right. That's what we're really talking about. And so where do the assets flow? And, um, and I, I think, I think uh, if you look at what's the hardest asset, most, most secure asset out there right now, you know, look, Bitcoin doesn't leak. It has infinite cargo capacity. And so I, I, I believe that uh, the, it, it's, its day has come. 
let, let me let me pull up what I think is really central here of what really drives me. Um, I'm going to pull up. Now, this is on. I, I wrote 22 use cases uh, when I was down in El Salvador. I was hanging out down there for like five weeks, uh, just before it went legal tender. Just you know, hanging out with Bitcoiners and orange pilling people, and you know, buying my my first coffee with Lightning Network. You know, it was just it was just fun. But down there, this this guy from the Federal Reserve, President Neil Nashkari, says that. Uh, uh, I've not seen any use case other than funding illicit activities like drugs and prostitution. And he was talking about crypto, Bitcoin. And I was pretty annoyed by that. So I went ahead and just wrote 22 use cases. And there's more than that, of course. But sure. the very first one where it really all started you know, when we could, when when Satoshi figured out how to do the double spend or how to fix the double spend problem, how to do a transaction without an intermediary, that was the big breakthrough. But uh but his his uh, post on February 11th of 2009, Satoshi Nokomoto wrote, the root, pro- the root problem with conventional currency is all the, all the trust that, that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency. But the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Now, if I... Have you ever been to this website called WTF happened in 1971.com? No, but I can imagine uh, what it's about. Let, let me share, let me share, share it with you. I didn't come into Bitcoin because of, I was a gold bug. I wasn't, I was into it because I was, I'm a private privacy advocate. I, I like encryption. I, I want that to, to spread. When did you right? when did you get into Bitcoin by the way? Well, I, 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 I was, I'm a late comer. I got into it in 2017. Mm-hmm. So. But but I had a few touch points before that, and it wasn't until like 2017 that it all came together, and uh, and I you know I went all in after that. But 2000 before that, uh, I was just into encryption. But if but again, let me get back to uh, WTF happened in 1971.com. Mm-hmm. They just have pictures, and one of the best pictures is they show um, productivity. It just keeps on increasing, increasing. But 1971 happens. And it's increasing, um, our wages are increasing with productivity. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, 1971 happens, and you can just see the the uh, wages flatten out. Real wages, not nominal wages, real wages. You know, and so yeah, productivity keeps on going up. So where is that productivity going? And uh, with the magic money printer at the Fed, really, what's happening is that that productivity is being centralized. The financial class is getting it. Yeah, it's and our fan hmm? stolen. It's being, you know, it's being stolen. It's yep. being stolen. Absolutely. Yep. And, you know, the financial class is expanding and the middle class and, the, you know, the poor, they're being eviscerated. It's a, it's a rigged system now and it's getting worse. It's not sustainable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I got to go back to, I want to go back to the great reset aspect for, for one moment, just so I have uh, further clarification there. Cause I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I never heard of, Bitcoin kind of being called a great reset. And there's obviously a lot of kind of negative connotations, like with the bit great reset being something that's, you know, oh, yeah. driven by the World Economic Forum. Uh, you mind ex- explaining a little bit more there? Kind of what, what's your take on that? And, and what, you know, yeah, I mean, nobody has a monopoly on phraseology. Nobody does. And, mm. uh, and you have to understand the phrase in its context to say this is what it is. Right. And in the Bitcoin context, uh, clearly Bitcoiners understand the Great Reset entirely different than most people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Great Reset is is really um, it's if you look at history of fiat currencies, you know, they they they, they have a for over 400 years, they have a history of kind of disappearing and then a new you know war will be fought. And a new reserve will be established, and that will last for maybe a hundred years, and then something else falls 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 apart, and, and mm-hmm. a, a new nation state will take over. Like for example, in the Weimar Republic, um, before World War II, uh, there is reparations being paid to France and Germany, and uh, excuse me, France and England, and and perhaps other uh, nations, um, and and so. Uh, the the Weimar Republic in Germany kept printing and printing, and next thing you know, you had 
wheelbarrows being brought in to buy one loaf of bread. I mean, we've all heard those stories, right? Mm -hmm. So, so their 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 fiat currency collapsed, and uh, and Hitler came to power, and then big war, war war broke out. I mean, people were in a desperate situation because the currency collapsed, but it really really started with with money printing, um, and and so uh, you see this. And over and over, it keeps happening. Uh, we have a um, sovereign default, you know, and uh, and is it going to happen again? Well, we've been in a really good situation for decades now, but we're running uh, a lot of risk, and and you see signposts all over the place, and there's a lot of precedent. I mean, there's there's already defaults happening. We've seen it in Zimbabwe, we've seen it in Venezuela, Venezuela, we've seen it in Lebanon. If you look at these 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 CDSs or credit default swaps, which indicate risk, Turkey's in, in bad shape right now. Uh, they, they aren't even listing Russia, you know, because it's so bad with, with these uh, credit default swaps. Mm -hmm. so, so, and another problem is these banks are interrelated. They have exposure to each other. So if one goes down, they start to take down each other. And that's where you get the contagion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. The, the reason I'm pushing on the on the Great Reset comment because there's there's also the kind of the, this idea that um, you know do do we have to potentially be concerned about Bitcoin itself, um, you know, leading us to this more dystopian uh, outcome as opposed to the you know the utopian one that we're that we're hoping for, in that you know the world will be opting into a completely transparent ledger. Uh, you yourself said you're you're a privacy advocate, so all all the all the potential you know negative things that can go along with the fact that now you have this this database that's tracking uh, everyone's financial movements and forever saving it in a database that can never be deleted. So there there is kind of that 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 meme and that that thought that's thrown around with you. Oh well, you know maybe maybe Bitcoin is actually the thing that will. You know, lead us closer towards the the feared dystopia as opposed to further away. So, just curious what your what your take is on that. And I'm sure we'll touch on it in a couple of different ways as we, as we go along. Well, you know, Bitcoin really is layered money. You know, you got the the primary network, and then you got secondary layers, um, which would include not Lightning Network, Lightning Lightning Network, and uh, Liquid Network. And I'd, I'd even consider Monero to be uh, also perhaps a second layer in in some respects there's some tethering going definitely definitely some tethering yeah there's some tethering going on there so um so we have some layered money that's emerging and bitcoin if, if you want if you want to follow satoshi's you know what is it um history history the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. In other words, printing more money than they should, you know, stealing, counterfeiting more or less. Uh, then you have to have a traceable ledger. And that's that's what Bitcoin is. But when you get into these second layers like Monero or Lightning Network, you, you, you have to have that uh, privacy uh, or people want that privacy. Oh, so you think fundamentally the base layer needs to be completely transparent? I think every every transaction needs to be either traceable back to the genesis block or to the coin base issuance of the coin. It needs to be traceable for right. there to be only 21 million coins. Okay. Well, I mean, like Monero has that, right? It's just not yes, in a, it does. as an obvious way in terms of where you could literally view it. And and take out your TI eighty two and and add up you know uh, all the transactions, but there's there's commands that you know in the software where it you know can basically audit and show you that all all the coins that are supposed to exist exist and no more. And 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 let, allow me to interject here. Um, agreed. You know, if we look at our our current system, we'll have we, the U.S. dollar used to be. Uh, let's say pegged to the, the gold standard mm -hmm. that went away in 1971. And, uh, and now it really be, let's, let's call it a petrodollar. I won't get into that, but, but we're losing that, that commodity as far as the, the, the peg is concerned. Um, but since you cannot debase Monero, 
it can have a peg to Bitcoin, right? You can have, there's a relationship in turn, and, and, and you, you, you don't have to uh, be concerned that an, an intermediary is going to come in there and start printing more. But what I wanted, what I, what I wanted to interject was um, really like Senator Warren is really into this KYC stuff, this know your customer. And as a privacy advocate, uh, I'm not so concerned about it. In fact, I think KYC creates huge amounts of friction. It's very detrimental to our economy. And it's not catch, it's not really getting rid of laundering anyways. I mean, some of the most, mo some of the, most of the laundering, um, a lot of it is done through real estate. And they're very KYC compliant. In fact, they love KYC. Look, I'm, I'm compliant. But now I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I was reading an article how Trump had bought a property um, and then about a year or two later, it was this huge mansion, doubled the price and sold it. And he originally bought it, I, I don't know who from, I, you know, perhaps the Russians, I don't know. But, but uh, the point is, is that laundering money through real estate is very difficult to, to, uh, to follow the money, so to speak. It, 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 it's very difficult to prove that laundering took place, even though people are writing about it. You know, journalists understand it. Well, how do you prove that? So even if you enforce all this KYC stuff, even down to the $600 per person or per tr transaction, it's still very difficult. So it's a waste of time. If, if we, when I was in El Salvador, you know, I, I had the strike wallet and it's KYC compliant. And, um, and I was talking to, you know, I wanted to, to install Bitcoin, Beach, oh, excuse me, Bitcoin Beach Wallet. And uh, I was told that I, I wasn't supposed to because I'm an American and it's not KYC compliant. <laughs> and this is what they're using down in El Zante right. and everyone loves it. And it's like, wait a minute, I can't use this wallet. That's, you know, because it's, it doesn't, it's not KYC compliant. And uh, so it creates all kinds of overhead. Now, if if uh, some of these people down there, seventy percent of them were, were on bank. Like I, I bought a, a dollar uh, water for a dollar using Strike, and uh, I, I I went from Strike to B Bitcoin Beach Wallet, and it was no problem. But why do we try to have all this overhead to protect who? The person who's unbanked down in El Zante. You know, make it mm -hmm. make things more difficult for them. No, it doesn't make sense. Um, if we'd stop trying to protect everyone, maybe 70 percent of the people in El Zante would be banked. Oh, by the way, 70 percent of them now have have uh, Lightning Network wallets and, and they are getting banked without the help of the United States and their their intent to protect mm -hmm. people just just by keeping the KYC away from this or away from from the bitcoin beach wallet you know it's a simpler wallet and they're using it they're happy um it's kyc i'm not a, i'm not a big advocate of of K, kyc no you're yeah customer. yeah 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 you, you know either either am i i think governments are just using it for the purposes of gaining data of, of over people and using it to essentially uh control them right and, and benefit from that uh, obviously it's it's sold as a as a way of protecting the people through preventing things like funding terrorism and you know uh, money laundering um but i i don't really believe that that's ultimately uh you know uh, what what comes of it i think there's a, a lot of negative that comes with it which is basically invading people's privacy right so uh yeah you know yeah. what, what happened to you know the kind of the fourth amendment here right why, why all of a sudden with with this are we okay with uh knowing everything about everybody without getting permission first from the government you know why are we throwing warrants out the window when it comes to essentially uh tracking and tracing people's transactions you know there's that i think it's called the third party doctrine right so this idea that when you use a banking system you're you're essentially uh, throwing away your 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 rights to to privacy because there is no expectation of it because you're using the banking system so your expectation of privacy goes away so you should be okay with the fact that uh, the bank the banking system knows all your transactions which I think is complete hogwash and especially if we're now creating a system where 
that's no longer the case, right? So there is there is no banking system needed for this purpose. So why why do we still uh, you know uh, kind of abide by that that old doctrine where we're saying there's no expectation of privacy? Yeah, and, and I'm a little bit even more cynical than that. And, and really, take, more than that, I'm pretty cynical. <laughs> I, I, I'm even more cynical than that. I mean, the, the, the Fed, you know, Janet Yellen, when she was chair of the Fed, she was asked in Congress, "Should we audit the Fed?" And her answer was, "No, no." Hmm. And that gives them asymmetric information. But she wants to base she wants audits on every U.S. citizen, even down to six hundred dollars per transaction. Right. And because she, they can use that knowledge. I mean, let's face it. The Fed is a bank or at least it is representative of, of a bunch of large banks, you know, that have they're they, they're very much uh, they work together. You know, U.S. Treasury uh, sends out a Treasury. Um, these, these like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, they buy these, these, these U S treasuries, then the fed, you know, want to, wants it to appear like it's free market that we, this quantitative easing is, is not really a, a centralized economy. We have to make sure that it appears to be free market. So they'll buy those, those same U S treasuries back, you know, and they, and they still get to keep their spreads. They're making profits. So, so yeah, these people are making a lot of money. Uh, they are. They want asymmetric information, so they they know how to make investments and make more money. And so this is this is gathering intelligence on U.S. citizens for their investments, mm -hmm. and they don't want to be audited. You know, that's like, wait a minute, how does this work? I mean, are we a bunch of cattle being milked yeah. by these banksters? Uh, this yeah. isn't right. I mean. See the, the thing that I, I ultimately, uh, you know, you know, uh, arrive at is we. It's it's not about relying on governments or hoping that they do one thing or the other. Or you know, I think it's great that you're running for 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 Senate, and you know, I myself ran for Congress, so I obviously believe there's, you know, it, uh, you know, there's there's progress that can come from that. But I feel yeah. like the the real the real way to win here is to build technology that's essentially uh resilient and immune to what the government may want to do um and that's where i then take issue with something like bitcoin because i just think it has a large attack surface that allows governments to essentially do things that will you know allow them to gain advantages over people by being able to retrieve data about them uh, and then to hope that they don't do that or to try to pass legislation, like even say like getting rid of KYC AML or reducing those things. Rather than fighting to do that, we build a technology or we all start using a technology where uh, it's, it's immune to what the government may try to do or regulate and we just go ahead and, and start using it. Douglas, I, I agree with you. I believe Monero and, and Bitcoin have a has a very strong symbiotic relationship. They they help each other in in what what consumers want. It's it's symbiotic. Yeah, yeah. So um what what do you you know, one of the things I'd always say is when you know when I'm when I was running for Congress, the reason and this is to the crypto people, not the, the general public, because most of the general public, especially you know, even though it was only two years ago, had less of an understanding of a crypto, uh, was that I wanted to see somebody on the floor of Congress, or you know, uh, or or a senator to to make the argument when it was brought up because it gets brought up time and time again, and we'll continue to see it more uh, that crypto is used for these nefarious things, that Bitcoin is used for these things, is to not so much deny it and say, oh, well, that's just a mere fraction even though it is, and it'll become a smaller fraction as it gets adopted larger in a, in a larger way. But to kind of make the the free speech arguments as to why, sure, uh, sure, it's used for these things, but the, the more important thing is to realize this is just a tool like the internet itself, and we want to live in a society where people can transact without censorship and without surveillance. And you have to essentially take the bad and the good. And you don't really hear any representatives make that argument. Rather, they they just default back and fall back on, oh well, actually, uh, you know, with Bitcoin, we're we're catching you know criminals in ways we've never been able to catch them before. Um, actually, because it's a transparent ledger, 
you know, this guy would have gotten away with this if it wasn't transparent. So in fact, uh, it's, it's a better tool for fighting crime as opposed to making the argument, which then aligns with something like Monero, like, no, uh, you know what? Y you're right. Uh, there it is going to be used for nefarious purposes. Ultimately, you know, ransomware probably would would not be as easy or as profitable, but for cryptocurrency. Like let's let's be honest. Uh, but uh, you know, the the good far outweighs the bad, and there there's ideals that this country was built upon that that align with what these systems ultimately are are, are going to achieve. Curious, well, would, would, would you well, be making those arguments? Well, let's let's just say uh, surveillance and fiat, uh, weaponized fiat or fiat that is controlled by the politically powerful. Um, they they say, hey, I'm not. We're, we're not going to do it. We're not going to abuse our authority, right? We're not going to take advantage of that. But uh, but eventually they do. It's just too tempting, and when they do it then then um yeah they'll, they'll catch somebody who's bad or or uh or putin will lose power i mean keep in mind something like that just happened which i think is probably the biggest milestone in terms in, in terms of crypto and, and bitcoin news of two of 2022 and that is the g7 froze uh, a bunch of u.s treasuries russian u.s treasuries they violated that trust. It's not money. It's it's a weapon now. The fiat currency is now a weapon, and it, it's not money that that uh, that you can put into your into your res foreign foreign reserve and foreign currency and 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 treat it as a global reserve because it can be taken snatched away from you at any moment. And uh, you know, the U.S. has been doing that. In, in the past with Iran, but now we're talking about a G20 country now. We're talking about Russia. And uh, and so this is going to cause, let's say the, the so-called, um, or I don't, I don't want to just, let's call them the bad guys, okay? We're, we're trying to catch bad guys. So we need surveillance and, and we, need, we need control. Um, uh, you know, you can do that once and then the the so-called bad guys they're going to wise up and they're going to they're going to do other things there's there's other ways they can launder the money and uh, and so I, I i'm a big advocate of having let's say separation of state and money uh, because there's just so much history of the, of the abuses of, of fiat currencies in the past it serves dictatorships more than it serves criminals and i think the problem with dictatorships is far worse than the the criminals and their activities associated with laundering and that's that's what i'm more concerned about no that, so, that, that's great so is that, that that's essentially the argument you would make if they said you know senator solston uh are, are are you concerned that that bitcoin is being used by by russian oligarchs to avoid sanctions uh if it was fiat currency, the fact that they weaponized it, uh, that's okay with me. And, and I'll tell you why is because I, I believe uh, Bitcoin is going to fix that regardless. It's it's going to happen. So whether they they use that, let's say, one time weapon, because they aren't going to be able to use it in the future, because I can promise you the Chinese are watching this. The the Beijing CCP Communist Chinese Party they're watching this. And they have, I don't know, roughly, what is it, 1 trillion U.S. treasuries in reserve in China? Well, I, I'm sure that over the probably the next 18 months, they'll probably reduce, it, they'll reduce that significantly if, if they want to invade Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they saw there was a mistake. Uh, it, it surprised me the G7 was able to freeze that or the, the fact that they would do that and uh, more or less say that okay this us dollar really isn't a global reserve anymore it's not it's not a uh, what do they call it the us treasury uh, uh, a risk free asset it's no longer a risk free asset as of this past two weeks there's a, there's a definite risk the g7 just can decide to take it away from you they can freeze it on, on a whim 
So uh, it's it's not really money anymore. It's uh, it's something else. It's it's a surveillance coin. It's, it's not a surveillance coin. It's a I, I don't know what to call it, but it's it's not an it's not a risk free asset anymore. Uh, it, it's it's how long can it remain as a global reserve? Uh, not very long. And if you look at histories of fiat, they they what typically last around about hundred years, and we're we're getting close to that. Um, you know, it's been a glo global reserve for more than 70 years now. Um, so, yeah, we're getting at, at the end of a very large debt cycle. And uh, the Great Reset is going to happen whether we like it or not. The question is, it, it, are we going to go in for a hard landing or are we going to have a, let's call it a hydraulic effect where we have an easy transition, not an easy transition, but a transition into something that actually is evolutionary in terms of our monetary system mm -hmm. how about in the scenario where you know government essentially embraces bitcoin but does try to ban something like monero which they see as you know uh more more disruptive because of the the inability to to track and trace it i i don't think they can because it's distributed you know they, they can ban it for their citizens in their country but monero oh. and bitcoin will survive in other countries no of course global. but i'm saying you, you know you're you're running for u.s senate so like you know what would be your you know kind of reaction to that if uh tomorrow warren was like you know what bitcoin's yeah i changed my mind bitcoin thing is fine but let's ban let's ban monero at least can we all agree on that what, what would be your your reaction to that I would not support a ban on Monero. I, I, I'm like I said, it's on my platform. I'm a privacy advocate, so yeah, I would not. In fact, any any time any time Senator Warren talks about Bitcoin in a letter, I I will respond to that in a letter, and and provide technical accuracy um, every time she does that because she provides so much fear, uncertainty, and doubt regarding Bitcoin because the. The technology just goes right over her head, right. and then secondly, she, it's very convenient for her to to not understand it because she's part of the boomers that you know houses go up, stock market always goes up. We sure. socialize the bankruptcies, and you know, this is a benefit to the boomers. But the millennials, they're in the rig system, and they got to pay the taxes to pay it off, pay off the debt, and pay the boomer entitlements. Yeah, she's, well, she's on the losing side of you know yeah. corruption, of course. And whether she even realizes it or not, the people that fund her campaign let her know that, right? So they're like, you know, you gotta stop, stop the soul. We we want to continue to print money. Is essentially what it comes down to. So that's right. Not, she, not she's, she's into this MMT, this modern monetary theory, which is uh, the 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 central bank can print as much money as they want, and and the truth is they can. The the MMT works, but what you have is a centralized economy at that point and free market disappears and you know it works for a while and, and it can get you through rust spots and it's really good during wartime mm -hmm. but the problem with with a centralized economy is how do you price things you know i mean do you have 13 men in a room deciding what the price is for millions of, of different products out there it's right. impossible right. you know and and that's that's the beautiful thing about the free market system is it, it, you're constantly optimizing or you're 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 creating new you're finding new efficiencies across millions of products every day, and and uh, you know it's our our economy is really free market is truly emergent it's 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 really beautiful, I mean if you look at ants for example they have a few rules. And, you know, like they follow this chemical snip, smell for a trail of food. They, they follow that chemical trail for a, for this is where they take their dead ants and, and their waste. And they have some other chemical trails. You know, they don't really have that many rules. And ants are, they're not very smart by themselves. But as, as a colony, a, a sophisticated colony emerges from all these individual ants, just from a few rules. And, and Bitcoin is like that. And, and Monero is like that. In that, you know, the, the consensual rules in Bitcoin, there's, um, I don't know how many there are, but 33, and those are enforced in in, in every block. And and if, you know, somebody uh, find, identifies, they, they look at those blocks and they make sure that all those consensual rules are being enforced on the transactions. If they're not, they're going to they're gonna go to a previous block and, uh, you know, 
jettison that block. That's how it's enforced. Mm-hmm. We're, we're enforcing rules without rulers. And, um, and these emergent systems, you know, it, it's truly a, a macro consensus machine. On, I, I think it's, the, you know, you can build consensus with a group and it, it's slower, it takes time, you have to go through education cycles with individuals, but it's really enjoyable if, if you are like an engineer when, when I was working in aerospace, it's worth the time and you learn a lot or you have to teach. It's actually fun, and uh, in, in 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 the proper work environment, and Bitcoin does something better than that. It, it it's it's not one group; it's all kinds of groups out there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And money is is really building a macro consensus across all of these different products. And that's the thing about a central centralized economy; it could never do that. Mm-hmm. And so, so Bitcoin really is is enabling a free market system and even though some of these economies that have keep printing money and they have to keep printing more money just to survive and they become centralized economies just by allowing bitcoin to be uh, not necessarily legal tender just say it's tax free allow it to keep and do a slow transition that will re-enable and and allow a uh, free market system to grow and flourish mm-hmm. and bring these efficiencies back to the the public which we you know we've lost over the past decades because of you know in many ways the united states is a centralized economy now thanks to quant- quantitative quantitative easing yeah 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 you have so many neurons triggering as you talk so many things i want to i want to talk to you about you're, you're getting a lot of thoughts going on in my head so uh you know to push back a little bit or maybe to, to catch you in in a, a catch 22 here so obviously big free market guy um you know let, let let the market decide so would you want would you want it to be that that bitcoin is legal tender essentially by mandate or would you want it to just be uh let's let's create a, a scenario where anybody can use anything they want for the purposes of money and it's legal tender well the, my number one primary objective as as a senator on the floor will be to make Bitcoin legal tender, but we have to do baby steps to get there. But uh, I'm saying, would, you, it, would it be that all crypto then is legal? Like, let's say somebody shows up and wants to, you know, make a Monero transaction. Am I getting capital gains tax? And it's just, it's just Bitcoin that has the loophole, or you know, are are they equally considered legal tender? And then may the may the best money win, or maybe multiple ones are are used for different use cases. Um. I'm 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 a Bitcoin guy all the way. Uh, as far as having, you know, having tax-free Bitcoin, that's that's what's on my platform. That's what I wrote. Uh, am I willing to do that for all crypto? Crypto is a big umbrella. Okay, I, I I look at crypto as being there's thousands of coins out there. In fact, is CBDCs? Would you consider that to be crypto? You know, the the central bank digital coins. Sure. I mean, we haven't seen what they are yet, but uh, there, there's some. Right perverted form of it that I personally am not going to be using. Well, I, I can assure you I'm very strongly <laughs> against CBDCs because they are surveillance coins. Right. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm opposed to CBDCs. But why, why not so, have where it's just so, kind of free market money and, you know, let, let them, let the technologies compete. Uh, so, you know, I could, I could spend my Bitcoin or I could spend my Monero, uh, you know, and if somebody's willing to accept it, sure. But there's no... Yeah, I'm agree. I'm agreeable with that. But if if it's a CBDC, uh, I'm going to oppose that. If it's a surveillance coin, uh, I'm going to I'm going to oppose the right. Well, coin. that that would probably become the way of it would be implemented by obviously by the government, and it would essentially be mandated. That that's the scary part with that, right? It may be yeah. that you essentially have to use the CBDC, right? It's like, oh, you want to pay your taxes, you have to use uh, you know the CBDC U.S. coin, right? Uh, it's the only way we'll accept payment and taxes. Who knows what they're going to do? Yeah, yeah, I would be strongly opposed to a CBDC. Hmm. Um, okay, well, I, I I like this direction you're moving in. You know, I I, I would certainly be happy if I could go uh, spend my Monero, and it's it's just like spending my my cash, right? It's not a taxable event. Mm-hmm. Um, you think we get there? You think we get there? I I think we eventually get there. You know, but do you think we get there soon? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, yeah, there's two topics I can bring up on that to support that. 
one is Eisenhower and El Salvador, where they aggressively said, make it legal tender. And that put a lot of responsibility on the merchants to, to come up to speed on being able to receive that. A baby step would be, hey, let's just not tax it. And that way, if a bar or a cafe wants to accept Bitcoin, it's not a taxable event. Yeah, that would have been that that would have been a baby step. Mm -hmm. And that, that's since the U.S. is a bigger country, we need we need to do that. I believe El Salvador is going to benefit. Anyone who adopts Bitcoin earlier is going to benefit in the long run. I believe that. Um, it's, but, but the U.S. is already going in the direction of of uh, having transaction free crypto transactions, um, up to two hundred dollars in the House, up to six hundred dollars in the Senate. Uh, Susan Suzanne Delbany, she's she's in my district, forty four district here in the state of Washington, in the U.S. Senate. Or excuse me, in the U.S. House in, in Washington, D.C. Um, she's part of a $200 limit on, t you know, non-taxable event. Right. Uh, uh, sen yep. Senator Loomis, she's got a bill up to $600. So we're already heading in that direction. Mm -hmm. But I want to keep it going because because of it's really about the great, great, deep, uh, the great reset for me. Um, I believe that a lot of these sovereign bonds are going to start to de default like popcorn popping um this next 10 years is not going to be nice to, to the fiat commodities they're going up in price right now inflation is going up it's a direct result of all this money printing and the money printing has to keep accelerating just to keep the economy going but as they do with that the boat keeps on getting heavier it's like they're putting in bigger engines to, to push the boat forward, but the boat is sinking, you know, with these these bigger and bigger engines, so to speak, or metaphorically speaking. Uh, I, if we don't have Bitcoin, if we don't have something to do the Great Reset to transition to, uh, where do we go? I mean, if we look at history, it's, it's some kind of violent war, you know, I don't want to go there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, another thing that pops into my head as you're talking, you know, you're talking about Bitcoin essentially as being a consensus mechanism, maybe one of one of the the greatest ones we we've, we've ever had to date. Um and I agree with you there, but once again that's what led me to Monero because I th I think, you know, as as part of having an efficient consensus mechanism, you're going to want the units of because we're talking about in terms of money, right? And that's really what Bitcoin is is being used for. Everybody agreeing on, all right, we're sending this amount to this person or to this address. Uh, the fact that Bitcoin essentially is is not fungible, so it's it's a less efficient mechanism for purposes of of transacting and keeping track of who owns what and what's going to who, because the the units themselves can be can be marked. They can be blacklisted. We, we're, we're seeing that happen in real time now. Um, well, well, Doug, Douglas, let me, let me slow that down with you because I, I, sure. let's unpack that. I, I don't know. When you said Bitcoin is not fungible, let's, let's slow that down and sure. talk about that. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, the, the fact that um, you know it, it's a transparent ledger, right? And every transaction comes with a history. So the Bitcoin that you have looks different than the Bitcoin I have because they have two different histories, right? Uh, whereas something like Monero, there, there just is no history. There's no history you could even see. And so the fact that this history exists, you could essentially um, mark different coins and give them different value based on what their history is. So mm -hmm. you know, uh, a coin that was you know given to me by... Uh, you know, a, a terrorist may not uh, have the the same value or ability to be transacted as as a clean coin that came from a KYC AML exchange. Um, so this idea that one Bitcoin doesn't equal one Bitcoin because of their transaction histories and the ability, and because of that, the ability of governments to essentially blacklist uh, coins or outputs. Okay, I, I see. I, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, and we're seeing it in real time. You know, where these are these are this used to be hypotheticals that we'd make on this show, but now we, we we're, we're seeing it right. Uh, we we we've seen actual coins be blacklisted. You know, where we're imagining that you know perhaps uh, miners may have to become 
compliant to exist, let's say even in the United States, right? They may have to follow certain regulations and have to become compliant miners and they'll only be able to process certain transactions. You know, uh, they wouldn't be allowed to process the transaction if it's, you know, being sent to a certain wallet. Uh, so just how, how does that tie into your, uh, you know, view of, of, of Bitcoin as this kind of, uh, ideal consensus mechanism, and is it is it ideal enough, or does this well, fungibility flaw hurt it in the long term? Uh, I, I I believe Bitcoin is fungible. That's that's just that's my perspective. the 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 mining situation with with uh, in the United States, sure, it's becoming a little more centralized with all the mining that's occurring in the United States. But uh, I, I'm very confident that uh, we're going to have mining become more distributed, uh, going more to the South America and other places in Africa. Um, be, so, so as far as having, uh, wait, wait, you know, when you say, when you say you believe, it's like we saw like in in Canada with the with the trucker situation and people were donating. They literally listed wallets that were that were blacklisted. The the yeah. Canadian government. That's uh, right. And Bitcoin allows them to do it because it has this essentially this attack surface. So it, it does. It, but but keep it, in mind that it, that attack surface is 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 on the exchanges. Okay, so how they're doing it is that they're controlling Bitcoin through, you, you know, for example, Coinbase uh, blocked a bunch of Russian wallets, and you know, there's some oligarch that has I don't know how much money has no access to that money thanks to Coinbase. So yeah, you're right. It, it, it they can um, they can block it, but if you keep it off the exchange, and uh, you're controlling your own keys, it is your money at that point. They yeah, can't but you're always going to be interacting with the real world, right? There's always going to be, you know, the you're going to have to spend it, right? So let's say exchanges go away, uh, but now now you're spending your Bitcoin, you're going to buy your Ferrari or whatever it is, and mm -hmm. now they're connecting your identity with your Bitcoin. Um, you know, maybe it's just corporations at that point, and then the corporations are are being, you know, there's chain analytics companies that are existing. They're funded by governments, which then collect the data from corporate. You know, like the there's always going to be whether even if even if exchanges go away and everybody just uses Bitcoin off off the grid, so to speak, they're going to have to interact with the grid to spend it. And then that's where you're going to have these connections between identity and and people's coins. Well, I, I wouldn't say that the, the Bitcoin network is is 100 percent transparent. There are ways to maintain privacy, even even on on Bitcoin. If you get to the second layer uh, and I agree with you that you can do chain analysis and you can make, uh, let's say, relationships with those transactions. If you know the identity of, of the other party um, and you do that multiple times, you can identify um the one person that has all these different relationships so yeah that's that's what chain analysis do does and uh, that's why we have this let, let's call it intelligence and so that's the point is we do not need kyc we don't need to know your customer because the government has the ability and chain analysis has that ability to to to, to, to do to do that um and they can track down some of these these bad actors but let's not pretend that it's 100% transparent. It is not. Uh, th there are ways to maintain some some privacy with Bitcoin. Now, on the second layer, uh, there are, there are ways to really enhance your privacy with Lightning Network and Liquid Network. And there's going to be other competitors that come into that space. So when you talk about light, like, like I said, uh, the Lightning Network uh, wallet that was being used down in El Zante, San Salvador, you know, Bitcoin Beach wallet, no KYC, okay, mm -hmm. and and so and, and of course there's other wallets out there, Wasabi that, that that's very focused on on privacy. So there's going to be competition on the second layer to have uh, private transactions. Let's not call them Bitcoin. Let's call them Sats, right? Because they're going to be small denominations. You aren't going to be moving a billion dollars around, but you're going to be, you know, spending five dollars here, ten dollars there. And uh, there's ways to, ways to maintain privacy not only on the non-custodial uh, Lightning Network wallets, but on the custodial 
there will be ways to maintain privacy. Of course, an intermediary is in, in, involved with the custodial, and they may be able to give your information up to a government. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but with global competition, uh, there's, there's real promise for cash-like privacy for differing cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I mean the the global competition thing. I don't buy into to so much because you just see that there's like one or two associations that basically control the entire world when it comes to creating these banking regulations. Um, you know the uh, what, what's um, I'm I'm losing uh, the name of one in, in my mind right now. Uh, but basically, you know these these global uh, associations. I guess the financial action task force is, is one thing um, that, you know, that, you know, they're, they're not really a government entity, but uh, governments listen to everything they, they say. Right. So they say, oh, uh, these should be the new regulations that we, we all use. And next thing you know, the United States adopts it, the European Union adopts it. And next thing you know, the whole world is now, uh, you know, doing KYC AML by mandate for all crypto. Uh, so it's like. Yes, there's competition between governments, but it's also things are, are, are pretty global and, and centralized in, in many ways. So I, I don't know. I don't know if that's if that part is going to work out for us. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I'm not a KYC ALA, a, mm -hmm. ALC expert. I am not. Um, I, I do believe that when it comes to these these fiat currencies, uh, we're going to be moving towards you know as 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 the US dollar is losing its its global uh, its you know global reserve status it's 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 going through the process of losing that crown um especially with the G7 seizing the US treasuries uh, i i'm going to suggest that the currencies are going to become increasingly regionalized in fact i wouldn't be surprised if we have multiple global reserves in the near future yeah. So yeah, it is. It's the Financial Action Task Force, right? Is is the global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog, the intergovernmental yeah. body that sets inter that sets international standards. So it's not. It's not even. You know, nobody elected them. You know, nobody. It's That's just right. an international body that sets these standards that then everybody adopts, and then they're basically forced to adopt it if they want. If you know, if you're a country and you want to participate in in the banking system. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that part is going to be harder than than we may than we may hope. I mean, we saw it even with Russia, right? So how how did they deal with Russia? They they kicked them off the SWIFT network, right? That's you know that was yeah. the, the way they did that. Um, so the, the you know the concern is that those same pressures may 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 apply to crypto, and they'll be able to essentially force governments to. KYC AML uh, channel everybody through these KYC AML uh, on ramps and off ramps, and then sure, go ahead, use your crypto, use your Bitcoin. But meanwhile, everybody's been identified and then perfectly tracked and traced thereafter. Could you imagine a world twenty years from now where there truly is a separation of uh, state and money? Twenty years from now. Oh yeah. Oh twenty. I don't know about twenty years from now. Uh, maybe. You know, maybe that might, you know, like you said, blossom somewhere first. I don't know if that's going to happen in the in the U.S. in twenty years. You think that quickly in the U.S.? I don't know. I don't know. I, I th maybe it's thirty years. You know, but in either case, uh, all these KL, uh, KYC stuff, it, it just goes out the window. It becomes irrelevant. And and the point about KYC is, like I said, I'm a cynic on this. Is it creates a huge amount of friction? Okay, it really. Um, and yet, all this laundering is still going on. You know, the, the Russian oligarchs still get, uh, they, they, they're still getting loans from Credit Suisse, you know? And, and so a lot of laundering is already, it's still happening with our traditional banks, regardless of, of uh, these, all these different KYC surveillance rules. So do, you, do you think these, these rules and the people mandating, we should be... Like that's the way we fix it is by fighting against them and getting governments to 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 not adopt them and to change the rules or, or what do you, what do you exactly say? Like obviously, yeah, sure. If I could snap my fingers and make KYC AML go away, that would be great. But 
how how do you see that happening then? How how we my, my my point is this is that more surveillance, more control doesn't reduce the the crimes. It it, it doesn't reduce the laundering. Um, right, but how does KYC AML go away? I I'm saying they keep they keep expanding it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this idea of going from ten thousand dollars and you have to report that now it's going to go down to six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're expanding more and more surveillance uh, and and we're not getting any kind of audit out of the Fed. So that's the problem is what kind of laundering are we really stopping? Uh, it's to me, it's it's really more or less surveillance. And and uh, it's more about control of the citizens rather than reducing crime. No, no, but I'm saying, but what is going to be done? So you you as a senator, you know, what's the Congress going to do? What's the United States government going to do? Are they going to move in a direction then where they get rid of KYC AML? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I would I would work to reduce those. You know, it's, I would work to reduce KYC requirements. Uh, I would like to get rid of the six hundred dollar uh, reporting to uh, you know when there's a six hundred dollar transaction. Uh, that to me is is uh, it's counterproductive. You're adding a lot of friction to the economy. You're, you're not reducing um, you know laundering by bad actors. Uh, that that's that's my position. Uh, like I said, I'm a privacy act act uh, activist, and I will. Uh, try to enhance the spread of of encryption so people have more privacy, and uh, and we we will greatly uh, reduce the friction in the economy, and the economy will, will thrive because of it. Um, the reason why I got into Bitcoin in the first place is because I, I used to about thirty years ago I used to um, work for a software company before Google was around, and encryption uh, was illegal. I mean we could we could have so much encryption and then not anymore. You know we had limits. In other words, uh, the U.S. government wanted to be able to, you know, spend a certain amount of computing um, power and break the encryption and read what was happening. They wanted that ability, so mm -hmm. we could use some encryption to take care of, you know, day-to-day -day stuff. But if they really wanted to break it, they wanted to be able to to create the backdoor. Mm -hmm. So um, I was very interested in that topic. Uh, it made no sense to me why they were doing that in the first place. It just did not seem in alignment with American values. And I don't know if you've heard of the history of, of Phil Zimmerman. He created- Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he uh, might, was, might speak at our conference in uh, in Miami where we're, we're Yeah, talking. he's he's leg, legacy hero dude all the way. Mm -hmm. So he he did something amazing. He, he uh, did PGP, pretty good um, protection. And the US government fought, uh, sued him and, and called it, his encryption, a weapon of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his defense at the Supreme Court was printing out the code, throwing it down and saying, look, this is not a weapon of mass destruction. It's not WMD. This is free speech. Right. And the, they, as you know, as you know, they, they, they ruled on Phil's side. And here we are. We mm -hmm. have far more encryption now. And we have a lot more privacy, thanks to Phil Zimmerman and P his, his work on PGP. And that has directly um you know worked into uh, the bitcoin code mm -hmm. and and it's free speech now so so that's the reason why i got into bitcoin was from the encryption angle it was in 2017 that i realized wait a minute if you can be moving money around and if 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 it, if there was a backdoor people would steal the money so the fact that money's moving around that's proof that the the encryption is working there are no backdoors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i i was thinking uh you know we can use this you know with no intermediary that you have to trust this is a template for for building software so that we, we can get away from all these walled gardens we don't we don't need all these walled gardens like google and apple and so on we can start building more distributed systems and and that will greatly reduce friction and uh, you know, bring powerful design tools to, to the masses. And wow, what a world we could be living in! And you know, playing all with all kinds of what if scenarios and, yeah. and credible, credible engineering. And so I'm super excited about this. I, I'm really excited about the the future of STEM. 
you know, science, technology, engineering, and and manufacturing as we we go through the digital transformation and accelerate that for STEM. I mean, this is how we we bring prosperity and wealth to everyone, not just a few, not just the financial class, everyone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, uh, pre- preaching to the choir. Uh, this is great. Uh, I think we, we have a lot in common, too. Uh, I saw you were a patent. Oh, yeah. agent. I was a patent attorney for a little bit, never really practiced. But, you know, I, I, I was an engineer by trade. I was a civil engineer. Uh, physics was was kind of my, was what I what I liked in high school. And then I went into engineering and then uh, became a, uh, a I went to law school with the intent of becoming a patent attorney, which I did. But then I never I wasn't really into the the whole filing patents thing. It was a little. A little boring to me. Yeah, that, that led me to a question, you know, because I always looked at, you know, when I, when I read the the Bitcoin white paper, I kind of read it as somebody, you know, essentially uh, almost like reading a patent, right? So, what what do you see as essentially the the claim in in the the Bitcoin white paper? What is the the novel thing that you'd be able to claim there? Well, I would call it a, a, a method method claim um, or a method patent. And the reason why is because there's no one ingredient that is truly innovative, truly novel. It's it's the recipe. It's the combination of how they come together. That was uh, like if you look at, uh, you know, how, how the blocks are, are brought together, um, like hash cash, for example, was invented by Adam Back, hash mm-hmm. cash. And that that Satoshi took that. In fact, he cites Adam Back and and. Uh, and that became um, proof of work, right? Mm-hmm. So there's proof of work, and there's the Merkle trees. The Merkle trees were pre-existing. He, you know, Satoshi didn't invent the Merkle trees, but it's how he put it together mm-hmm. that that solved the double spend problem. And and let's unpack that for a moment. I mean, really, what is the innovation? Um, there was a, a problem in distributed computing for many, many years. And they called it the, what is it? The Byzantine generals problem, right? Yep, yep. And and the problem was, is if you have a, a critical mission where you have all these generals together and we all have to attack at the exact same time, but, and if and some of us decide not to, um, that mission critical effort will fail. We have to have everyone synced up. Uh, we have to have, you know, one, one, um, representation of truth, more or less. How do we get that message around to everyone? How do we know that's not going to be corrupted? How do we know it's not going to be intercepted? That was the Byzantine general's problem. Mm-hmm. And and more or less, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto solved that problem, right? Mm-hmm. He, he, the idea is that when you spend this once, we know you're not going to be able to take that digital coin and spend it a second time. And because there's only one representation of truth through Bitcoin through the macro consensus machine. That's what I've called it, um, or, I've ref- or I've written that um, before. And uh, and so that was the big in- innovation, was uh, no double spend, no need for intermediary. Uh, it would be a method patent that would be multiple steps involving multiple technologies. It's not blockchain. That 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 is a, I, I would call that a, uh, misdirection on the part of Beijing because they hate, hate Bitcoin. You know, they, they're all about centralized everything, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the communists want to centralize the economy and they want to centralize credit and they don't want to have property. You know, the government owns all that. Um, so they're very, Bitcoin is just, they do not like it. Oh, but I, I will say this. One thing about the Chinese, I do think they love the US dollar. And, and here's why, is because we are, you know, one of one of our fastest growing aspects of our economy over the you know past five decades is that we keep on printing more and, and exporting U.S. Treasuries, right? So we have to, to 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 be able to do that. We have to maintain a trade imbalance, and so they take our U.S. dollars and they buy hard assets. You know, they buy even property hard assets here in the United States stocks and equities and, and and around the world and they're building sky rises in New Zealand Auckland like crazy and other big cities and in in Africa. And so the, the, my point is is I think Africa really likes the fiat system as it stands right now, but they definitely hate Bitcoin uh, because it is decentralized and it is a threat 
to their centralized way of thinking. And yeah, just following up with the you know the the, the patent talk there. So, um, do you then potentially see Monero as patentable? You know, beyond beyond Bitcoin, right? So now, now we had Bitcoin; it solved the Byzantine generals problem. Uh, and then something like Monero comes along and and solves the you know the fungibility problem problem right so now you have this the same mechanism the same thing uh, but you're no longer able to view the ledger see the amounts see who's sending what to who but with the same uh, more basic technology behind it engine behind it but then this additional uh, novelty that allows you to um, you know transact without without tracing or tracking. Did I lose you? Well, well, I'm. I mean, what does it What does it mean when a for something to be fungible? Um, I mean, I'm just I'm just looking that up really quick. You know, it just means exchangeable. Um, well, every, every unit equals every other unit is the simplest way of uh, describing it, right? One dollar is equal to every other dollar. Yeah, interchangeable because they are identical to each other for practical purposes. So, you know, are you saying that Bitcoin? is not fungible and monero is fungible yeah i think that's the simplest way to explain it i think you could say it in other ways too um but just this idea that you have blockchain you have uh miners they're coming to consensus there's a ledger uh but now you cannot view the ledger you can't see the amounts and you can't identify who's sending what to who because of additional uh, tech. That's uh, I'm I'm having a hard time protocol level, right? So it's it's built into the the base technology. Yeah, I, I think there's a place for for, for Monero. Um, I'm having a hard time syncing up with you on saying that Bitcoin is not fungible. That's that's you know it's hard for me to to sync with you on that one. Yeah, I mean that's odd because we, we, I mean, we see real world examples of the fact that it's not. We know for a fact that it's not currently. Maybe it's somehow. Well, yeah, let's try to unpack that. Let's let's talk about where it's not fungible. I mean, you, you're saying that, that you gave me an uh, instance of Canada, where some wallets. Yeah, we're blacklisted. Um, yeah, we've seen um, uh, the government blacklist various wallets. Canada is the most recent example of that. Yeah. Um, I, okay, so so let's say that that's I would call that a hit and a miss because if it was on an exchange, yeah, they could they could freeze it. But if it was on a on a wallet off of an exchange, they couldn't freeze it. So y there were there. Were, cases where they could and there's cases where they could not so it's it's the, you know the mime or the meme uh not your keys not your you know bitcoin uh so the, the point is is that you take it off the exchange you keep it you know in your own wallet yeah i don't know man you got you got to get beyond the uh the fact that it's it, it's it's clearly currently not fungible like that's not even really debatable like i could see how theoretically I, like maybe one day it becomes, but as we stand today, there's, you know, there's Bitcoin uh, that you probably would not want to accept uh, from 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 people, knowing that it's it's coming from a blacklisted wallet, a sanction, you know, a sanctioned wallet. Well, get, get, let's 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 talk about um, a real life example. Where would be a scenario where I would not want to accept accept Bitcoin? Let's let's put this in, in uh, if, reality. You know, the government came out and sanctioned some wallet and saying, you know, this is a, a sanctioned Bitcoin address, and then you know. But how would that impact me? How, as a Bitcoin user, how would that impact me? Well, you wouldn't be able to send uh, Bitcoin to it, and I guess theoretically, you're not supposed to uh, accept Bitcoin sent from it, right? From from who? Let's, let's do a real example. From, from this sanctioned it, Bitcoin address. And who theoretical. would that be? Who, who would that be? Uh, I don't know. Some some terrorist group. You know, I mean, this this already exists. You know, we we we've seen wallets get sanctioned. Okay, so a terrorist group, um, such as let's let's say, I mean, let, let's say let's say the Taliban in Afghanistan are categorized as a terrorist group and they have bitcoin 
and I'm I, and I want to buy an AK-47 from them. You're saying that the U.S. government would be able to say, "I can't buy that AK-47 from that." I'm saying, that, that say the, Tal the Taliban showed up, or you didn't know they're the Taliban, but somebody shows up and they they send you a payment, right? You're selling okay. a car, right? Okay, I'm, I'm, sell I'm car selling a car to a terrorist. Well, you don't know that you didn't maybe you didn't know he's a terrorist. But he shows up and say, "Hey, I got Bitcoin. I'm gonna give you one Bitcoin for that car." Yeah. Uh, you realize that you know because it's maybe it's even uh, built in such a way. Currently, it's not, but in such a way where you know it's coming from this this address that that's been sanctioned. You're probably yeah. not gonna want to accept that Bitcoin, right? You're you're well. Right? You're saying I, I I I didn't know, but you say I wouldn't. Okay, want you do to. in the scenario. You do right because you could they. You know, you know, like you're not. Okay, so you're so you're saying that I know that this this wallet is sanctioned, mm -hmm. and I but I I do want to accept the money or I don't want to accept the money. Well, sure, you're trying to sell your car, right? Okay, uh, but now you probably you don't. I don't think you want to get paid from, right? From this wallet that's been yeah sold. I yeah I don't think this example I, I, it's not making making sense to me so the that's idea not, of saying, that's not making sense okay it's not making sense to me the idea that Bitcoin is not fungible I I believe Bitcoin is fungible okay that was that was like the most extreme example to to but there's even you know less less extreme ones um but yeah I mean we're we're seeing it in the real world it's not it's not theoretical. Uh, yeah. You know, could could Bitcoin somehow become fungible? I I don't know. I guess well, as, as more people start, well, to like, think, I, but it's always like I, you're always I, 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 able to essentially mark mark coins, right? So we even know coins that have been coin joined. We know they've been coin joined, right? We 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 could identify that. Um, so you know, let's say you know now now you can't send those coin joined coins to an exchange, right? So are those coins worth less than ones that you could send to an exchange, right? Are they losing value because of their lack of fungibility? How would you stop those coins from being sent to an exchange? Because exchange be can accept it. They're going to okay. say no. They're going to say you're going to have to tell it, you know, we're not accepting this. You can't, you can't. So they're, you're saying that the... And we're recording you. Okay, so you're going to say that the exchange is going to say this coin cannot come to our exchange. Okay, the, the coin is being blacklisted. It's in some wallet. It, it was it was involved. We actually have some history on this, right? Um, like uh, Mt. Gox, some of those wallets were blacklisted, right? Mm -hmm. Money was moved from Mt. Gox. It went to a wallet, and they were, let's say, blacklisted. And chain analysis was watching them. It's like, where'd this, where'd this Bitcoin go? You still couldn't stop the coins from being moved around the world. Um, so there's really no mechanism to stop the movement of, yeah, of but if, coins. If, sure, but effectively they can be stopped, right? So you go to you go to send it to an exchange, right? You're gonna go. You want to You want to go turn it into U.S. dollars. You go to send it to the exchange, and they say, "Sorry, uh, we're not going to accept this." Um, I, I, you know, let me just say, let me just say, I, I disagree with you. Bitcoin is not censorable. You, you might be able to censor it in one country, but to glo to censor it around the world in every country, not possible. It's effectively effectively censorable by the fact that you can see a history and and denote where they're coming from and what its previous history is, as opposed to I send Monero to the exchange. There's nothing they can't say. Oh, it's blacklisted because there's nothing to to even look at. Let me let me ask you this: Like, would you you know? Because we were saying you know the KYC AML, like you know that would be great if that disappeared, but it's here. It's probably going to be here for quite some time. Would you recommend to people that are you know removing crypt, taking crypto off an exchange? Right? They they bought their crypto and now they're going to remove it. Would you re recommend that they? move it off the exchange in the form of Monero so then they don't have a trail and then maybe they turn it back into Bitcoin if they want through some decent No, no, that it, it's, there's more to it than just privacy. Uh, I, I think it's important to get your, your coins off, off, off of an exchange. Uh, keep in mind, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, all the stuff that we're talking about, it just becomes irrelevant because KYC 
and ALC or ALM or you know this these this the surveillance that's going on is uh it's just not going to be relevant um when there is a separation of money and state i, I believe we're going in that direction i don't know that's, um, that's a pretty big risk i think that's uh why why take that risk when we have a tool that 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 you know makes that irrelevant now well I, i'm not saying the u.s dollar is going to disappear i think the u.s dollar is here forever it's just going to devalue forever <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and I, I think we can have multiple reserves, but if people really want to have privacy, I'm just saying there's going to be options. There's going to be some money that is going to be separate from a state. That's emerging. And whether it's Monero or Bitcoin, it doesn't really matter. It's happening. And so, so I think that these KYC issues are going to become, uh, it's just going to become a mute point 20 to 30 years down the road. But, but in, in regards to, to fungibility of, of, Bitcoin, I believe it is sensor proof. I believe it is it is uh, sensor proof. But the reason why I'm also into Bitcoin, but there's many other use cases as to why I'm into Bitcoin. I believe Monero is good for the privacy, but but uh, Bitcoin, um, you know, there's a there's a store of wealth issue. Um, I, you know, I just would have to collect my thoughts on that. Yeah, no, um, worries, no worries. I was just trying to get um, get some you know, in insight into you know whether or not you you would advise people currently today if they were going to you know let's say remove their their crypto for an exchange, maybe do it if, and if they had the option, do it in the form of Monero, so they they there is no trail, right? It's like taking cash out of a bank. Uh, when, I, when I go take a thousand dollars out of the bank, sure they know who I am. They know I took a thousand bucks out, but they don't know what happened to it thereafter. Uh, so, yeah. so why not do that with with crypto and Bic Monero being the cash of crypto? Do that, and then sure you could move it back into Bitcoin in some decentralized way. Um, yeah, but is that well, something you would you know currently consider or recommend or any? Well, let me let me answer your question with a question. One thing that I really enjoy talking about is decentralized currency. You know, gold was kind of decent, mostly decentralized until they, you know, put everything into a vault and it got centralized. And about every hundred years, a war happens and they steal it, right? Uh, so gold was is a good example of the, the benefits, the value of having decentralized currency. Um, it's sound money. It, uh, when you When you have sound money you have a, a renaissance you have a flourishing of, of culture community humanity um, we saw that in the, in, the, in the 14th century um, decentralized decentralization was great uh, like for example um, the uh, the printing press decentralized the production of books there was a flourishing there was a renaissance uh, the TCPIP internet was a decentralization of the network, and, and we had an increase in the velocity of, of information. And we've had a flourishing because of that. Here's the question for you. Who, I know Bitcoin is extraordinarily decentralized, even more so than gold. And I believe the currency that's going to be, let's say, truly achieve a separation of state and money, you know, over a period of decades. I believe Bitcoin is going to be there. So the, here's the question for you. Who do you think is more decentralized, Monero or Bitcoin? And if you do believe Monero is the most decentralized currency, why is it the most decentralized? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, but it's impossible to answer. But I would say it. it um, they both have architectures that make them decentralized and i would say arguably monero has one that has an architecture that uh potentially can or would theoretically make it even more decentralized than bitcoin um uh i would look at you know the mining for example um monero is mined by cpus so there, there is no asic mining uh the cpu is the asic of monero 
Uh, so very decentralized in terms of, uh, of its mining network and it will trend towards being more and more decentralized in that respect because everybody, you know, everybody has a CPU. Um, not everybody has access to it. And, and, and it's, uh, so, um, so there's, let, there's, let me there's different, it's a very complicated, you know, so we, you could go through all the elements of it. You know, there's the mining network, there's, so, so you're saying the, the mineral, there's the, mine the code itself. There's, there's a lot of aspects to decentralization. There's there the, are. how permissionless it is. Um, and I think when you, when you add those all up and you look at the overall architecture, I would say, is Monero currently more decentralized than Bitcoin? Probably not, uh, only because it's younger. Um, but does it have the potential to be more in the long run? I'd say yes, given it's it's it the way it's architected. Yeah, you you know, I, I would uh, I would I would say that's that's a possibility. Um, but it's not just the code, um, as you know, the the network effect. You know, anyone can go out and take. Bitcoin code and they can copy it and set up another coin and there's thousands of them now. Sure. But but you cannot copy the network and the network is something that is being built um you know with electricity, you know. It is it, there's a proof of work involved there. Uh there's a lot of cost involved and that cannot be copied and pasted. Uh in, in other words, uh, there's a connection of this this abstract ledger to the real world. Mm -hmm. And that's through mining. And sure. that's why we, we can't go out and just print like they can to infinitum with, with fiat. We can't do that. There's a limit to 21 million. So, so the point is, is that, yeah, uh, I'm not really up to speed on Monero mining if it's more decentralized than Bitcoin. I don't know. Um, but one thing that Bitcoin has in terms of just being larger um, being older, it has that network, and it's really hard to replicate that. Once you get get ahead, and you start moving, um, it, it's kind of like Google has amazing search engine algorithms. Could no, another search Metcalf's engine... law, network effect. Totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. And I, yeah. I always make that argument on on the Monero side. And what what I would say is uh, two things. One. We see Monero eating into Bitcoin's network effect for the use case of digital cash, uh, organically. You know, not hey, mandating it as legal tender down in El Salvador because the president wants to be famous, uh, but actually because people are opting into it out of a real need and they use it on the dark markets. Uh, ransomware hackers offer a. a a 20%, I think it's a 20% discount if ransoms are paid in Monero. Whether or not you agree with these use cases, it shows that it's eating into uh, Bitcoin's network effect for the purposes of digital cash. I'm not saying buying it because you know you want to store your wealth in it and you think it's digital goals, but I'm saying you have a need, you want to send some send money to somebody and you don't want anybody to know about it. Uh, people are opting for Monero organically, that's happening. Uh, and it, it has it's growing in that in that network effect. And then I'd say the second thing with regards to to mining, um, you know, I think and I always hear like Michael Saylor talk about it in these ways. And it sounds great in theory, right? Like very simple. You know, like we said, I'm, I, I'm at the physics, you're into physics. So it's great to be able to kind of talk about it in this idealistic way as like, you know, Bitcoin is is eating all the world's computing power and electricity. Um, and that's making it extremely incorruptible. But the reality is, it's uh, because of the nature of the way Bitcoin is mined, it is tending towards very large corporations that are becoming the miners uh, because they're the ones that are able to uh, compete the best, right? So they're the ones that have access to these ASICs. Nobody else does. And then, you know, they're the ones that are able to set up the essentially these mining farms. So you could have, you know, uh, hashing power that's more powerful than whatever, the, a million supercomputers or a thousand of the best supercomputers. But if the government can easily find these corporations, knock on their door and tell them to do, you know, ask them to do certain things, uh, it doesn't matter how much hashing power it has; it can then just be co-opted in, in that respect, as opposed to something like Monero, which is mined, you know, by people, and it's very hard to detect where they are, who they are, and to kind of, you know, 
get to them? Well, we we did go through the block wars um, in 2017 with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that scenario did play out. Um, there was, I forget which company it was, I, I'm, I'm not really up to speed on the block wars. But, uh, you know, in, in summary, um, there was some pools of, of miners out there, but they had individual contributors to that pool. And those individuals, even though there'd be large pools, uh, it was the individuals that, that basically controlled whether we, we would move uh, the consensus rules towards bigger blocks. Well, they didn't because even though they were pooled, it was the 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 voting power through the through the mining was distributed, and uh, since then uh, I I disagree with you that, that mining is becoming more centralized with Bitcoin. I believe that that the Bitcoin mining has become increasingly decentralized, and we're trending in that direction, which is healthy for Bitcoin. Uh, it, it's only centralized a little bit in terms of consolidating here in the United States because you know China made it Ill mining illegal but I think overall the, the the macro trend is is that Bitcoin mining is uh, becoming more distributed more but is, isn't it lar large companies that are doing most of the mining they are they 99 percent of the mining um it's let's just say it's big money to 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 get into it and um but it's becoming more distributed within these pools in terms of the investment and the pooling that's taking place like i for I, somebody had just like one asic and they got a coinbase you know worth how much is it uh, uh i should know this what uh what's the coinbase reward I think it's right like now. 12 and a half right now, right? I don't know. Yeah, are we at 12 and a half? I, I know this, but I just haven't thought about it for a long time. I, I think it's uh, six and a half. Uh, I, I forget the, the number of what, what the reward is. So you multiply that times 40, and that was their re reward. It's like they made bank. Right. But that, I mean, that's off, winning, off of one winning, ASIC. Winning the lotto, right? That's not, uh, that's not the normal. Uh, it was, the, yeah. Yeah. It was just an a lot of really. Yeah unreal experience and so you know do i think that that bitcoin mining is becoming more decentralized i don't i think i really believe it's becoming more decentralized but i'm not an expert on this topic so i'm you know this yeah, is a debate. yeah just making just making a, a point there and and really the, you yeah. know the decentralization is a means to an end right and that end is censorship resistance right that's that's yeah. really the the end that's right. That's uh right. which you know then ties back into the whole privacy right so it's like sure you can send a transaction but if i can see where it's going great you could press the button and there's nothing i could do to stop you from from the network uh propagating the transaction but i can knock on your door and say yo we saw you we saw that you sent that transaction you said you didn't have bitcoin you know, I, I'm 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 the government, right? You 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 said you lost your keys, and that's why you couldn't pay uh, the unrealized capital gains on your Bitcoin. Uh, well, uh, then how did you? Then why did we see that Bitcoin move? You know, like just another example of of if if the if the goal is censorship resistance, that ties into it too. You know, the the privacy aspect. Well, they're, they're two different topics. You know, I, no, I, I believe think they're not. They're over. They're total overlap. Complete. They're not different. Well, the transaction, you can't stop the transaction. The transactions are, are censorship proof. Um, that's, that's like saying I, I could go, I could go, I could say whatever I want to say anytime. And you, 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 you and I have already disagreed on that. I mean, we've yeah. already established that. But as far as having, you know, let's not conflate privacy and, and censorship um, proof transactions. Because uh, I, I do agree with you, though, that, that, uh, there is some traceability through chain analysis with Bitcoin, but it's the the uh, second layer is where I believe you can get more privacy and get cash like behavior with with Bitcoin or what I would call Sats because they're just small denominations when yeah. you're using Lightning Network. You're not you're not you're not doing transactions in the billions of dollars on the Lightning Network. You know, it's it's you know you're buying a coffee. You know, and for five, and the cost of that transaction is five hundredth of a penny, or if you're using a custodial wallet, then it's one penny. You know, I I know these things because I did that down in El Salvador a lot of that. 
uh, and that's where you get the the cache like privacy at that point. Right, and it makes it more censorship resistant, right? Because it's cache like. Uh, censorship resistant. Uh, what what do you mean by that? I mean, well, I mean, if you can't see who's sending what to who, it's harder to censor it, right? Sure, you could effectively press that button and nobody can stop it. Um, but people can can censor it post factum essentially by knowing who said what to who. Well, this is very nuanced. I, I, I from my perspective, and I know we differ on this. Um, I, I try totally to appreciate you putting up with me, by the way, because I this is you, you know uh, I I I'd, I'd, I'd vote for you just for just for the fact that you're you're willing to put up with my kind of Monero badgering here, and I apologize, but. Uh, we went down this road, and I appreciate you, you know, allowing. Well, well, I, I love technology, and for me, this is what I enjoy this kind of stuff. But, but my understanding is the way I look at Bitcoin is the transaction is censorship proof. Now, it, you're on the on the main Bitcoin um, network. You can, let's say, through chain analysis, um, you can uh, identify and trace some of the people. It's not always easy. If they're doing things carefully, they can maintain a lot of privacy on the Bitcoin network, but with sophisticated chain analysis, they can track some people, okay? But on the second layers, with the smaller amounts, uh, you know, the, the you know, you're not doing a billion dollars on Lightning Network, you're, you're doing coffee and so on. And that's where you can get the cash-like privacy is on the second layer, the, the Lightning Network. I, and liquid liquid networks is, is also a place where you can get a lot of privacy. Yeah, yep, yep. I mean, uh, well, I'm saying yep, 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 but I don't agree. I mean, I, chain chain analysis. I think even uh, recently announced how you know they they have tools for for uh, the Lightning Network. Um, you know, so I I don't know I don't know how ultimately how cash like the Lightning Network is is going to be. Um, but you know, uh, I, th I think we could we could close it out here. I feel like uh, we we covered a lot. Like once again, I yeah, really, yeah. Here, I, 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 had feeling, I thought uh, I had a feeling we're, we were going to go into like a fifteen minute discussion on Lightning Network, which, <laughs> which is fine. I lo I love talking about Lightning Network, but that's okay. Yeah, let's wrap it up and, and maybe another time in the future. We'll here, here, here. Yeah, and, September ten twenty yeah. in analysis to offer Lightning Network monitoring services. So I mean. Whatever you know, it's it's complicated, and but there, you haven't seen that yet with with Monero, right? So there, there is yeah, yeah. how how cash like things will be on the Lightning Network. Well, uh, it's hard to say. We know we know it's less decentralized than than the base layer. We could at least agree on that, right? Well, as a senator, as Senator Solston, <laughs> um, what I'm what I'm really concerned about is in terms of having, uh, let's say. I like Monero's privacy. Right? I'm I'm very cynical when it comes to the KYC. I don't think you're you're really, you know, really capturing bad actors. You're just adding a lot of friction to the system. But as senator, if if I'm going to consider Monero to be in that tax-free category for, uh, for, you know, um, payments, I for payments, yeah, I I would really need to dig deep deeper and really understand how how is how decentralized is Monero? Are they really a, a decentralized currency or are they vulnerable? You know, being centralized is a major attack bear, bear, uh, uh, vector. And and that, uh, you know, that puts the people, especially the people of the United States at risk. Mm -hmm. And and uh, that's, that's my primary concern is to reduce that risk. And uh, so that's something that I need to learn about more about Monero. Because I tr truthfully, I'm not, I'm not uh, I don't have a deep understanding uh, about Monero. I'm, I've studied Bitcoin intensely for about five years. You know, I mean, I, I just love re love studying about it. Uh, I love, you know, Bitcoin, Bit, um, mastering Bitcoin and mastering Lightning Network and and the encryption part of this stuff. And and I I, I love studying the use cases of how this can improve our monetary system, which is very complex and increasingly vulnerable. 
so yeah, I, I, I love talking about Bitcoin. I'm really glad you brought me onto your show, even though we have differences. So I, I, I like going deep and trying to understand understanding the differences you know yeah we we, we align literally 99.99 you know i think there's uh and it's it sounds like you know you're your only potential or maybe you have other ones but the, you know your biggest potential issue with monero would be would be the decentralization and that's uh um you know that's you know uh, something that you you should 100 percent be concerned about and i totally agree with you and but i think if you did your research you'd be uh, pleasantly surprised uh Monero is one of the true cryptos. Maybe there's only two, Monero and Bitcoin. Uh, most others uh, definitely fail in that respect with regards to uh, decentralization. Um, thanks, thanks again, man. I, I I love that you you know took the time to do this, and uh, you just allowed a free flowing conversation. This is unlike any you know. <laughs> potential elected uh representative of a high office would you know it, it wouldn't be i wouldn't find anybody else on the show willing to do this that's running for senate or at least that i that i that i know of uh so kudos to you greatly appreciate it um you think you have a have a real shot at, at winning uh, i don't i don't know the politics over there you know i i would think i i think i'm primarily interested in in running i, I really want to be able to talk about bitcoin and and make this a, a major issue. I think if we get into a sovereign debt situation and Bitcoin goes to the forefront of politics, you know, there's a possibility I, I could could become a senator. Um, but, uh, but you're running mainly, on the on Democratic line, and the current the current senator is a Democrat. Yeah, I'm a Democrat. I'm, I'm a social liberal, but I'm a fiscal conservative. So you could say I'm kind of red and blue. I'm purple, more or less. I'm Are you really, going to be running a primary or what, what's going on over there? I, we're in a primary. We, we kind of have a jungle. Where everyone runs and then two come out of that after August 2nd. And then we go into so two Democrats can run against each other in oh, the general. Different system. Okay. So, so that's a real possibility. And I think I'm actually more fiscally conservative than than our our Republican candidate. So, um, but I'm, I'm right at the very top social liberal, you know, I, I, I'm the sovereign individual, you know, queer rights, um, pro-choice. I'm a social liberal, but fiscal conservative. And, and uh, there's a lot of people like that in the state of Washington. So mm -hmm. I, I think I have a good like, broad uh, constituency on that. Uh, but the Bitcoin thing that that's the, the that's the wild card. And I, I say don't underestimate the the vibrancy of the Bitcoin community. Uh, I I think because of that, that's my wild card, and and uh, that that may put me in into the general election with with mm -hmm. the with the incumbent. But let me put a few plugs uh, sure. about me. Please do. Uh, one the main thing is I, I I would like support if if people want to, and the, where you do that is you go to solston.org, s o l s t i n dot org. That's my last name. Um, and that's my platform and also my page goes to act blue. Um, and then secondly, if anybody is interested in my use cases, I'm very proud of those. I, I wrote those when I was down in El Salvador and I continue to evolve them as, and if anybody wants to DM me and say, Hey, this is a place where you can improve them, do that. Cause I, I would love to improve that, but that's on my, my Zenimal.xyz, uh, website, and then just click on use cases and you can check out those Bitcoin. Uh, and that's where I, I read about, uh, you know, the Satoshi Nokomoto post back in 2009. Are you accepting Bitcoin donations? You know, I don't have that compliant with the FEC uh, re okay. rules. And there's people out there that are telling me that they, that they can do it. Yeah, you could do it. I just don't, I don't have the bandwidth to set that up right now. I, I've already written Act Blue and say, hey, would you do this, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and they say, you know, we don't have that right now. We don't have that available. So, yeah, yeah I'd like to. When I ran, we did it. You know, we even accepted Monero to a certain degree. There's there's kind of a, I mean, if if it's a low enough or, you know, obviously if you're getting the person's information, then, then that's fine. If essentially, if you're KYC AMLing them, right? That They just want to know who it is yeah. donating, um, which I don't know. That's a whole other topic. Do you agree with that? Do you think, do you, th do you think people should be able to anonymously donate to two campaigns oh that's, that's a big yeah. topic uh, is, uh no i don't no, no, no i don't no, no. yeah I, I don't because then then you get a lot of foreign influence coming into the game and that, that's just not 
I, I don't agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's a tough one. But, um, but really, my my number one thing, as far as you know, my awareness is our the number one thing is to break our broken monetary system, and 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 I believe, um, you know, sound money. You know, let's call Bitcoin digital gold, but actually better because you know it's um, there's there's a number of of you can move gold over time, but you can't move it over space like you can Bitcoin. Bitcoin you can move over time very rapidly. I mean, it's just as good as gold, but you can also move it much better than gold over space. You know, almost at the speed of light. So there's some real advantages. Uh, I, I really believe that Bitcoin is the great reset because it is it is gold 2.0. We're never going to go back to gold, but we have something better now, and we can go back to sound money, back to uh, you know sound money money practices. So so this is this is the great reset, and there's nothing more important than fixing our broken monetary system. Good stuff, man. Are you going down to uh, Bitcoin Miami conference? Uh, Bitcoin you, right too? No, I, I I wish I could, but I I can't. Um, I just I got stuff going on. I should go, but yeah, you should. Yeah, you definitely should. I it's should. a good, good place to to meet everybody. And and Monero, the Monero Topia conference is happening down the block, so you'd be you'd be more than welcome there. So let let me know. Uh, uh, certainly, ticket on the house if you, if you're in town. Let me know. Thank you, sir. And thank you for having me on your show. Really appreciate it. Of course. This is this is great. Once again, thank you for putting up. You know, if I, I was trying to get Thomas em, Tom Emmer on, he's a congressman that's very much into crypto. I'm sure you've heard of him. And I, I know if I did get him on, he he would not give me an hour and forty five to uh to to talk to to this degree. So I greatly appreciate the fact that you're willing to to dive deep and uh, have a little back and forth. So that that's awesome. You are most you are most welcome. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. for joining Cheers. us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.